يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم والذي قال لوالديه أف لكما أتعدانني أن أخرج وقد خلت القرون من قبلي وهما يستغيثان الله ويلك آمن إن وعد الله حق فيقول ما هذا إلا أساطير الأولين أولئك الذين حق عليهم القول في أمم قد خلت من قبلهم من الجن والإنس إنهم كانوا خاسرين ولكل درجات مما عملوا وليوفيهم أعمالهم وهم لا يظلمون اللهم لا تجعلنا من الظالمين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين Today's khutbah is inspired by uh, an overwhelming number of parents that I have had conversations with. Uh, and I've had these conversations with them here in the United States, here in our local community. I've had almost exactly the same conversations in different parts of Europe, also similarly different parts of the Muslim world, the Arab world, uh, even in places like Sri Lanka or Malaysia. The conversations are somewhat different, but overall they're exactly the same. And I wanted to take this opportunity in this khutbah to remind myself, because I'm a parent myself, uh, to remind myself and to remind all the parents that are here of certain realities that Allah makes very, very clear. They're not easy realities, but they are clear realities. This khutbah is dedicated to two audiences. It's dedicated on the one hand to parents, and it's also on the other hand dedicated to their children. So those of you that are listening as parents, also at the same time listen as offsprings of your parents. Allah Azza wa describes in many places the relationship between parents and children by way of example. So instead of talking about the theory of parenting, Allah gives many many case studies of parents and their children. And so you have some amazing examples. For instance, you have the case of Ibrahim alayhi salam, whose father, uh, and some argue uncle, but the, the linguistically it's still father, Azar, builds idols. He's actually the source of a lot of the idol worship in his town, and his son, grows up to be the great leader of the concept of Tawheed and the, the Iman in Allah Azza wa Jal that all the faiths, all the monotheistic faiths attribute themselves to in one way or the other. As a matter of fact, all of Islam is also called Millata Abikum Ibrahim, the religion of your father Ibrahim. Right? So on the one hand, you have a pretty messed up dad in, in simple language and you have an amazing son. And it's not like the son had an amazing environment, a supportive environment where his Iman fostered and things like that. It was a pretty corrupt environment. Everybody around him is worshipping idols. There's nobody who thinks like he does. As a matter of fact, he stands alone and he's considered kind of a rebel, you know, uh, when he criticizes these idols and he's kicked out of his house also. So the first thing that I wanted to highlight in this example is that one's iman, a young man's faith or a young woman's faith, according to Allah Azza wa Jal, isn't always only dependent on their environment. A lot of times we blame the environment. Well, what can we do? We're living in America. What can we do? They go to public school. What can we do? They're in a bad situation. So of course they're going to get impacted by that. Yeah, that's too true to an extent. But there's a reason Allah gave us these examples. This is the journey of Ibrahim salam before he became a prophet. Revelation is a later situation. First and foremost, he starts questioning and exploring and starts criticizing things that are happening around him. What that tells us is Allah Azza wa enabled human beings, each and every one of them, regardless of what environment they're in, regardless of what situation or what society they're a part of, to think for themselves. If they choose to follow everybody else and never think for themselves, that's on them. They don't, they don't get to say, well, what can I do? I was in a blinding environment. No, Allah gave you eyes. Allah gave you the ability to see for yourself. But on the flip side of this, you also have other instances. And to me, one of the most unique instances is the case of Yaqub salam, who has, you could argue, two sets of children, good kids and bad kids. It's the same father. And though some have tried to argue this, I think it's completely inappropriate to think that Yaqub salam is anything short of a great father. He's a prophet, and prophets are known for their fairness, for their goodness, for their ihsan to all people, especially their own family. So it's unimaginable for us to think that he was a good father to Yusuf, and maybe to Binyamin, the youngest one, and he was not such a good dad to the other sons. That doesn't make any sense. He's a father, and he's doing his best to raise his children, and he's actually later on, in this, in, if you study Surah Yusuf carefully, he's even giving good counsel and good advice to those sons that rebelled against him. 
So there's no reason to think he had a double standard. The point I'm trying to make is, he as a father and as a head of a household, as a parent, did everything he could to provide a good environment and a good education to his children. And yet the results that came are completely different. They're actually polar, polar opposites. On the one hand, and what makes it even more interesting, is that Yusuf السلام, was separated from him at a very early age. And so he no longer has a good influence. Yusuf السلام, no longer has a parental influence as he's becoming a young man, as he's growing up in a society. We learn Allah had given him a lot of you know, good looks, Allah had given him intelligence, high intelligence, great character. But he's living in a corrupt society in the house of a politician. And he's basically a young servant who has no parental supervision. He can do whatever he wants, in a sense, within that sphere of his. And on top of that, later on, he was called to wrongdoing. So he's, he's in one bad environment. And by the way, from there, he ends up even in a worse environment inside a prison. The people around you in prison aren't exactly the best of people. And so he's going from one bad environment to another bad environment. And when people are in that kind of a bad environment for a really long time, you would imagine they're going to come out messed up. Something's going to happen to them. They're going to pick up you know, uh, uh, the, the traits and the qualities of that sick environment that's around them. But if you contrast, and of course that didn't happen with him. He retained his pure character. But if you com contrast that with his other siblings, who are actually living in the household of a prophet, they live in the best possible environment. Can you imagine, your father is a prophet. You, you couldn't possibly be parented and be offered a better opportunity to be guided and to be raised right. And yet his brothers scheme and they lie and they backbite and they do these things for many, many years. And they're actually disrespectful to their father as well for no fault of the father himself. So the point I've tried to make thus far is that you have parents on the one hand doing nothing, like in the case of Azar, doing nothing. And yet the product is amazing. Ibrahim alayhi salam. On the other hand, you have you know, the case of Yaqub alayhi salam who does everything. And the product is sometimes awesome, like Yusuf alayhi salam, or not, like the other siblings who for many years were in rebellion. When you study the end of Surah Al-Kahf, you find some interesting case studies. First, you find a story of young men who have a career, they make a living by fishing, by going out at sea. But after that, after talking about young men who are trying to earn an honest living, interestingly, there are two other stories. And these, both of these stories are about young kids. One young boy is killed. And the reason given later on is actually this child, when he grew up, he was going to be a terror and a horror to his parents. And it's interesting that what we are told about his parents is abawahu mu'minayn, kan abawahu mu'minayn salihain. His parents are both, were both righteous, good believers. So these were two good parents who were going to raise a child to the best of their ability and he was going to be a horror for them. He was going to give them a really hard time in life. Okay? Tughyadan wa kufran, Quran will describe it as. Rebellion and disbelief. He's going to leave Islam and he's going to be a horrible rebel against his parents. Even though they did nothing wrong in raising him. On the flip side of it, you have a couple of orphaned boys who we don't know anything about. You know, Musa alayhi salam is told to build this wall. He has no idea why he's building it. Eventually, when the rationale is offered to him, why did you build this wall? It's actually about these boys whose father was a good man. وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا Their father was a good man who died a while ago. Now these kids are orphaned. These, they're being raised on the streets. And yet Allah azza wa jal wants them to have a good life down the road. Like He's securing their future down the road. What I'm trying to get at is that in this life, as far as our children are concerned, we have absolutely no control. We have responsibility, but not control. And we have to understand the difference between those two things. I have a responsibility to my parents. I cannot control my parents. I have a responsibility to my children until a certain age, until they reach the age where they are answerable to Allah for themselves. When they, became, when they become baligh, when they're considered adults by Allah, that means when they're standing in trial in front of Allah, Allah will not come and ask you first. He'll ask them directly because they, kulluhum atihi yawm al qiyamati farta. Everyone will come before Allah individually, all alone, nobody else. And so, we, as we raise our kids, when, we, when they get to a certain point, our love for them doesn't go away. Our concern for them doesn't go away. Our du'as for them don't go away. Our desire for them to live a good life doesn't go away. But is Allah going to hold you responsible for the mistake they make? No. To the best of your ability, you try to give advice and then you have to back off. 
This is something even the Messenger of Allah understood Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The, the man who had the greatest qualities in every sense of the world, the word, the greatest husband, the greatest leader, the greatest of all prophets, the greatest father. And what does he say to his daughter? Ya Fatima tu bintu Muhammad. He says, Fatima, daughter of Muhammad, ittaqillah. You need to have, the, you need to be cautious of Allah. Fa inni la amliku min Allah, laki min Allahi shay'a. I no doubt will have no authority to make any case on your behalf in front of Allah. You'll have to stand on your own. I know you're my daughter. But even that doesn't get you anywhere. Even that's not enough. You're going to have to stand on your own merits in front of Allah. This is an important teaching that we need to understand. We cannot, we cannot change the environment of our children and expect that they're going to come out perfect. We cannot later on start getting frustrated with them when they, change, when they make bad decisions. Because a lot of our kids will make bad decisions, like we made bad decisions. You and I made bad decisions too. We disappointed our parents too. They couldn't control everything we did also. We gave them a hard time too. So what Allah Azza wa Jal does in the Qur'an is He describes a scenario. And this, these examples that I wanted to give you was first, to help me remember and you remember that our children are simply an amana from Allah, a trust given by Allah Azza wa Jal. How well did we try to raise them? Did we do our part? That's all. Nuh alayhi salam is not questioned for how he raised his son. As messed up as his son was, as rebellious as his son was, he did his part as a father. He did what he could. The rest is between his son and Allah Azza wa Jal. But that doesn't mean that we don't love our kids. And in, like I told you, lots of conversations of especially mothers, and sometimes fathers too, who come in pain, in tears, telling me how they raised their children. They, they made them memorize the Qur'an. They sent them to a Sunday school. They put them in an Islamic school. They moved from one city to another, took a pay cut, sometimes even lost their business, just so they can bring their children into a nicer Muslim community, so they can have the environment. Everything was great. This kid's, his kid was so respectful, so loving, so kind, such a perfect kid, you know. And all of a sudden, something happened to him, and now he doesn't pray. And he talks back to his parents. And she stays out late at night. And when you try to question them, they snap. I don't know what to do. I can't even recognize if it's the same kid. Where do I go? What do I do? And that's happening over and over and over again with hundreds, thousands, if not millions of families. Children rebelling out of control. Now, there are lots of reasons for that happening. But like I said, first and foremost, this khutbah is directed at two audiences. Parents and their kids. I want to share with you this scenario, this idea that children that were raised by good parents rebelling and then completely becoming different people. Like the parents can't even recognize, you're, I can't believe you're the same child. I've seen cases where, where sons have hit their mothers. They've physically assaulted their mothers. I've seen cases where, where children have you know, threatened their parents, cursed at their parents, you know, stolen from their parents, all kinds of things. How did things get to this? Or come to them and say, oh, well, you know, I don't call you anymore because I don't believe in Islam. I don't, I, don't, I don't pray, I don't really believe in religion anymore, etc. And those parents are completely shattered. Not one, literally thousands of them. How does Allah describe this scenario? In a few words. Allah Azza wa says, وَالَّذِي قَالَ لِوَالِدَيْهِ As for the one who said to both his parents, أُفِّلْ لَكُمَا I've had it enough with both of you. أُفِّلْ لَكُمَا is not, I would not translate this as, woe unto you. It's a son who's listening to advice, the mother keeps telling him, Salli, 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 Namaz Parlo, Namaz Parlo, Namaz Parlo. He comes, keeps coming to him, just pray, just pray. Can you stop doing this? Can you stop doing that? Just, you know, come home earlier. She keeps giving him advice, 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 and he's had it, he doesn't want to hear it anymore. So he just says, enough! Come on, stop it already! Ufillakuma! Both of you, I've had it! Ata'idani ni anukhraja? You keep promising me that I'm gonna come out of my grave? So many people have died before, nobody comes back. Get over this whole hell heaven thing. Let me live my life. I just want to live my life, I just want to be happy, okay? Why are you guys always talking to me about, okay fine, if I have to burn in hell, it's my problem. What do you have to do with it? And slams the door and walks out. This is, this is the scene, it's not a new scene. This is happening for thousands of years. And so what do the parents do? وَهُمَا يَسْتَغِيثَانِ اللَّهِ They are begging, the mother is crying at night, praying in tears, Ya Allah, my child, my child, my son, my daughter, what do I do? She used to wear the hijab, she used to memorize the Qur'an, now she's completely become a different person, I don't even know what she's up to. 
you know, where she goes, who she hangs out with. I found drugs in her room. She smelled like alcohol the other day. Ya Allah, what do I do? Yastaghithanillah. Istighatha actually means when a town is desperate, it hasn't had any rain, and it's, drought, it's, it's dying in drought, and people desperately turn to Allah for a miraculous rain. Huma yastaghithanillah means yeah, they're asking for a miracle from God Himself. Change something in my life, help me with this. And then they turn to this boy and say, Wailaka amin. Curse you. Believe. The parents have had it too. They can't keep giving soft, loving advice. Wail is not a soft word to use. It's actually one of the names of one of the worst places in hell. But outside of that in Arabic literature, wail is used as a horrible, horrible curse against somebody. And when they say, Wailaka, you know, curse you in a sense. Damn you, why are they saying that? This child, this most beloved thing of, you know, product of their love, this child that they raised with so much sacrifice and so much concern, you know, the ones you love the most can cause you the pain the most. This child has cost them so much pain that at this point, instead of making dua for them, it's just the ugliest words even come out of the parents' mouth. Even parents start saying horrible, horrible, horrible things out of frustration. Mothers have done it, fathers have done it. In the middle, in the heat of an argument with their children, just said some really terrible, terrible things. Quran captures it. Wailaka, amin. Believe. Why don't you believe? Why can't you just be a normal kid? Why can't you be like everybody else? Why can't you be like Yusuf? Why do you have to be like this? You know? And this kid, by the way, it's, it's remarkable that Allah captures reality in not in idealistic terms. He captures it in pragmatic, like exactly how things play out. He turns back and he says, فَيَقُولُوا مَا هَذَا إِلَّا أَسَاطِيرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ This is nothing but old stories. Can you stop? Can you stop giving me the old stories? The mother starts quoting an ayah from the Qur'an or telling him about this prophet or telling him about this hadith. Or he says, can you keep this old stuff to yourself? I don't need this anymore. Thank you very much. I don't want none of this. You keep these stories and you tell them to somebody who cares. Tell them to somebody who's interested. Subhanallah. Ma hada illa asatirul awaleen. And some of you, as you're listening to this, you've actually experienced something like this. You've lived it. Some of you are living in that horror in your homes. Every time the son walks in, there's an argument between the parents and the children. My first address is to the, the children. Understand that when you're doing this and you think you're fighting for your happiness, you're, or you're in some unique situation that nobody understands you. Allah understands and the crime you've committed against your parents isn't a small one. That is not a small crime. <laughs> those are the people that the word, meaning the verdict of punishment, is rightfully deserved by those young people. <laughs> this is the same story for, for all kinds of nations of jinn and human beings. Rebel, rebellion has always been there. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا خَاسِرِينَ They've always been losers. You will not win in life. You will, you will hurt your parents. You'll rebel against them. You'll run away from them. You'll do whatever you feel like doing, thinking, I'm just living my life, let me breathe. You'll never find happiness. You'll always be a loser. You'll always find yourself in loss because of the suffering you caused your parents. It's okay for you to have doubts. It's okay for you to question, why are we following this religion? That's fine. But the way in which you dealt with your parents was merciless. They gave you love, care, and mercy, and you gave nothing but pain in return. Innahum kanu khasirin. And you may not be like the, the example that was just given. So what does Allah Himself do? Walikullin darajatum mimma amilu. And for everybody is according to the degrees that they did. In other words, some people are extremely rebellious. Some people are somewhat rebellious. Some people are not praying anymore, or some people are doing some haram things in life and they're rebelling. Some people have left Islam altogether. And now we're cursing Islam and cursing the Prophet and cursing the Quran. That's happening too. According to the degree of your crime, Allah will deal with you. So even though Allah has given one scene, in a sense the worst case scenario, doesn't mean everybody fits in this scenario. Allah Himself acknowledges that and said, وَلِكُلِّنْ دَرَجَاتٌ مِمَّا عَمِلُوا وَلِيُوَفِّيَهُمْ أَعْمَالَهُمْ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ They're going to be compensated fully for whatever they did. They're not going to be the ones that are wronged. But now I turn my attention as I close to the parents that may be going through this kind of suffering. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect all of our parents from ever having to see these difficult days. 
But first and foremost, this is a reality that even prophets were not spared. Nuh alayhi salam had to face it. You know, you have Yaqub alayhi salam had to face it, right? Ibrahim alayhi salam was terrified of it, even though he has fantastic sons, he was terrified of it. He made dua about it. You know, وَجْنُبْنِي وَبَنِيَّا أَنْ نَعْبُدَ الْأَصْنَامِ Keep me and my children forever from ever falling into the worship of idols. That's a dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So it's not like we're ever going to be free from that concern. But I will tell you one thing. In the ayah, there's an ishara, there's an indication. When you are, when your son is 18, 19, 20, 25, 28, 30, he's an adult. Maybe a young adult, maybe a very immature adult, maybe one that makes horrible, terrible mistakes in life, but then again, he's still an adult. And when that child, or that, that man or that woman is an adult, and they're making mistakes in life, what is your role? You and I have to remember, we're no, the rufi al qalam. The pen has been lifted as far as our responsibility is concerned. Our job was to raise them to the point where they become adults. Once they are adults, they are directly responsible to Allah. The more you try to control them at that age, the more you try to tell them what to do, the more you try to tell your 18-year-old, your 20-year-old, your 25-year-old to pray, 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 the farther they will run from the prayer, the more annoyed they will become. They will actually distance themselves from you, they will want nothing to do with you. They will see you, the mother who loves them. But as soon as they see you, you haven't even opened your mouth. Here we go, mom's going to start her lecture about prayer again. Mom's going to give me a whole talk about how I need to make tawbah. Or how I need to stop talking to that girl. Or how I need to stop, oh God, I, you know what, I'm not even coming over. I'm just going to go out. I don't want to deal with it. And the mom says, I'm trying to do da'wah. What do you want me to do? Not do da'wah? Not invite my child? Not make them better? Well, actually, the way you're doing it is making things worse. The way you're doing it is making things worse. Understand that there are two levels of the relationship you have with your children, especially when they get older. There's a spiritual relationship in which you're trying to give them advice, nasiha, counsel. That's a spiritual relationship. And then there's an emotional relationship. A mother is a mother. She loves her child. No matter if he's the worst human being on the earth, she's still going to love her child. And the, that child, that son, doesn't matter if he becomes 45, he still wants emotional support from his mom. He, should, he still turns to his mother for, for love and care. He still should feel like, I, no matter who turns me away, my mother will never turn me away. These two things, your role as a, as a spiritual guide, a spiritual counselor, and your role as a mother or a father are two separate things. You have to keep those two things separate. And sometimes, when our children rebel and go away from Allah, then they don't need you to be a da'i. They don't need you to give them spiritual advice because that will push them further away. They just need you to be a mom right now. Just make them food. Don't talk about deen for a while. Don't bring it up. Because you know the last 10 times you brought it up, what happened? You should learn from your own experience. Advise the father. Don't lose your cool. Don't start complaining. He comes, the son comes home once in a month. And that one month, the father says, oh, you finally show up? And he says, this is why I don't come. Because you talk like this. And he walks out again. What did you gain? What did you gain? This is why you'll understand that when Yaqub alayhi salam was brought a shirt dirty with blood, and he knew that his sons were lying, he knew it. He understood that right now I can do nothing about the situation. So the words that came out of his mouth are forever going to resonate for any parent who has adult children that are out of control. فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ وَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَعَانَ عَلَى مَا تَصِفُونَ The only thing beautiful left now is patience. I need to demonstrate beautiful... There's such a thing as ugly patience, by the way. But he needs to demonstrate beautiful patience. He needs to keep a smile, maintain at least the emotional part of the relationship. How are you doing, son? Are you eating well? Is everything okay? Don't bring up deen. Just maintain the relationship. Why? Why am I saying that? Because shaitan will come to that foolish young man or that foolish young woman and say to them, your parents hate you. They always criticize you. They're always nagging you. They're always lecturing you. Forget them. Live your life. Get away. They don't love you. If they loved you, would they talk to you like this? And he's gonna, he or she are, are going to go far and far and far away. Your job as parents now, perhaps more difficult than the waking up in the middle of the night and changing their diapers and taking them to the hospital when their fever spikes at two in the morning, you know, and taking care of their school and getting, you know, getting them ready and all, all those exhausting years that you had, that was actually easier. What you're being asked to do now is much harder to demonstrate beautiful patience. 
and maybe to find other sources to give them advice, not you. Maybe somebody else needs to talk to them. The worst thing you can... By, so, by the way, sometimes our children, they're programmed at a certain age, and you and I were like this too. You'll take advice from anyone except if it comes from your father. If it comes from your father, you're annoyed before he even opens his mouth. You're agitated. Your mother says, watch this video. Listen to this sheikh. Listen to this. Oh God, here she goes again. I don't want... You know, there are people who come up to me. You know, I hate you, they tell me. I hate you. I'm like, what did I do? He goes, not you. My mom makes me watch your videos all the time. I can't stand you. <laughs> Please don't make me watch. Make your kids watch my videos. Please don't. I'm telling you. You're pushing them further away. It doesn't help. You can't shove religion down their throats. Just be a parent. Just be a parent. As painful as it is, as rebellious as they've become, they need something else from you at this point. And so I leave you with the following. Even with Luqman, who's probably the longest passage on parenting in the Qur'an. There's no other place in the Qur'an that deals with the subject of parenting as exhaustively. And that's, even that's brief, but the case of Luqman radiallahu anhu. But look at how Allah Azza wa describes it, just one part of it. إِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِبْنِهِ وَهُوَ يَعِذُهُ There's lots of conditions. When at the very moment when Luqman said to his son, while he was in a position to counsel him, in other words, Luqman doesn't just give his son lecture after lecture after lecture, he finds the right time, the right opportunity, he thinks of a strategic opportunity, and then brings up, Ya bunayya la tushrik billah. My son, take Allah seriously, don't, don't do shirk with Allah. He doesn't just throw that lecture on his son constantly, there's actually a haliya wa huwa ya'idhuhu suggesting he was very strategic. If that opportunity presents itself, well and good. If it doesn't, then take your time, be patient. Parents that are in this audience already know. You've already had many conflicting arguments and discussions. You've already had fights where the, you know, somebody stormed out of the house or yelled and screamed or slammed a door. You already know that if you're going to have that conversation start again, it's going to end up the same way. Be smart about it. Don't, go, don't walk into that same trap again. You don't, I never want to be the kind of parent that has to say, وَيْلَكَ amin To get to the point where I lose it and I start cursing and I start yelling and screaming at my children. And I never want to hear from my children, this religion is nothing but old stories. And they're not saying it because they disbelieve in religion, they're saying it because they're annoyed with their parents. They can't take it anymore. This, needs to, this conflict, this tension needs to be brought down. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us wiser parents and, 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 and more obedient children. May Allah Azza wa Jal soften the hearts of both parents and children towards Allah's deen. And may Allah Azza wa Jal ease the suffering of the families that are having problems with their children. And may Allah Azza wa Jal give the children the sense and the guidance to come back and make tawbah. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا